What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs like the founders of P90X, Atari, and many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. This is part of the e-commerce mastery series where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your business. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, which helps service professionals, doctors, lawyers, accountants, coaches create additional revenue streams, stop trading time for dollars. Um, they hold you accountable to achieve your biggest goals with a step-by-step roadmap. Check out rise25.com. It's run by myself, co-founder John Corcoran, and it's application only. I am very excited to introduce Mark Werner. He's a founder of naturesleepandghostbed.com. He founded the company in 2001 and grew it to over 11 factory and warehouse locations worldwide in the U.S., Brazil, and Spain. They've sold millions of mattresses and offer a 20-year warranty. And he learned the value of maintaining the high-quality products from his family of inventors and innovators in the latter business. And I just found out talking to him that we are actually distant cousins by marriage. We're related. So, Mark, thanks for joining me. A pleasure to be here. Not many people I can say that I randomly find out were, were actually relatives. So. It's a small world. <laughs> it's well, small... they never burn bridges and always be a polite person. <laughs> right. I want to just start off, talk about, um, you come from multiple generations of inventors and innovators. What did you see firsthand from your family in, in the latter business? Well, um, my ancestors, my grandpa, his siblings, started the Werner Company at the turn of the century. Yeah. And they were just uh, hungry guys with uh, no, no money. And uh, their mission statement was just to kind of make dinner money. Right. Uh, it was very simple. It was nothing too sophisticated. My grandfather was a lieutenant colonel in, in both World War One and Two. Mm. And they started the Werner Company. It was a great, it's a great family story. It's a great business, American story. And um, he really bought some surplus goods from the, the military and converted it to uh, some binding for area rugs. Because back in the old days, they didn't have wall-to-wall carpetings. They just had area rugs, mm. and their area rugs would fray. Right. So he bought, like, uh, the Army guys in World War I wore bloomers. Mm-hmm. So around the calf muscle of the pants, there was, like, a Boy Scout belt-type material about an inch high and it was a uh, khaki green okay so that he always had a humongous surplus of everything so he said hey i'll buy that i'll dye it beige and i'll sell it as his idea his innovation was i'll sell it as a binding around this area rug that was fraying mm. and then I'll sell you know thimbles and and needles and thread and then the, the all the floors were wood so he would get some wax and he had some werner wax that when he was in world war one over in europe came across some some wax suppliers and uh, he was just a young guy just trying to make dinner money for a big family their father had had left so he was without a dad mm, wow there were i think uh, 11 brothers and sisters holy cow yeah so it was you know just it's a survival story and and that just evolved but he was very principled in terms of just always operating with uh, integrity and quality and a military type mind just a very uh, high quality dignified person and, you know, his motto was always that profits follow quality. It might not be that week or that month or that year, but if you do the right thing, you yeah. will be rewarded either economically or, yeah. you know, spiritually in, in yeah. a good way. It's a, a long-term good, okay. approach. A long-term play. Absolutely. Yeah. So as time went on, Werner ended up inventing the aluminum ladder. Hmm. And my dad's generation invented that and pioneered that first the aluminum ladder and then my uh then they invented the fiberglass and fiberglass ladder yeah and so i grew up in that environment worked there for a long time loved it had a large family everyone was active in the business and when you make a ladder it's really a safety product yeah so there's no there's zero yeah. tolerance for anything being yeah. wrong if someone thing you know missteps or they fall or breaks it's, it's, it's life or death it's life or death yeah so there's there's zero tolerance so everything we did had to be perfect to the fifth decimal right. so every rivet had to be right every aluminum batch that we cast had to be right had to run tests on everything 24 7 
So we were just always oriented to quality, quality, quality. Mm -hmm. So I always learned about quality from the time I was born all through the years right. and about then, you know, running all these factories because right. Warner was the largest ladder company in the world. Uh, That's with a wild. 85% market share. So we started with nothing and we ended up as the largest guy. And it took a long time to get there, but Warner is the brand for all kinds of ladders. And then we made all kinds of products, um, OEM products that go into automotive and we make heat sinks that went to car alternators and, and, and radios and switches and you name it we made sailboat masks we made the garage door um uh, track when you like open your garage door and if, uh, garage opens and there's a track there we make doors and windows curtain wall mm -hmm. there's thousands of applications the the rim for bicycles for the fancy bicycles that's an aluminum extrusion so all kinds of things mm -hmm. so i was always trained in, in quality and service and then we um sold the business almost 20 years ago this year hmm. and and i i loved it um i just loved the factories i loved the people we had a lot of unions but i, I we we got along just great with everybody we we loved it when there were three generations of factory workers you know grandfather yeah that's so, rewarding yeah so, yeah it's great and it was just a very good thing and even during the recessionary times throughout the years we liked to keep everyone employed We'd rather take it in the shorts ourselves, but keep everyone employed during the hard times. And right. we worked really hard to do that because there's always economic cycles and it's out of your control. Yeah. When the 73 gas crisis came and we had the recession, you know, we kept everyone going. And yeah. so we always had a great relationship and we had a great family business. We loved having family business because it was a it's a great binder to keep everyone together in the family. And uh, you still had to be qualified to work for the family business, but it's a great way to keep everyone together and get-togethers and stuff like that was that so, a tough decision to was, end up selling it was a very tough decision and it was actually a decision that I um, orchestrated 10 years before it ever happened really when, yeah when I first recommended it to my family and my board they thought I was the Antichrist <laughs> <laughs> they, they said you know what would grandpa think and I said you know something he was such a savvy business guy he'd think it's a great idea yeah. but uh, ultimately, it just took a digestion period. Why were you recommending it at the time? Because I felt from a strategic standpoint, we had a great business, but we had a lot invested into it economically, emotionally, earnings, pensions, your net worth, etc., feeding a lot of people in a very large family. So God forbid something happened where yeah. all of a sudden aluminum became outlawed some kind of crazy outlier event that we couldn't predict. And that's what an outlier event is. It's an unpredictable, unforeseeable event, right. but you know it's out there. Yeah. It's that huge hurricane that comes every you know 100 years kind of thing. So rather than subject a great family that's now four plus generations to some kind of horrible event, I thought if we had a liquidity event, that might be the right thing. Yeah. So we then evaluated a number of alternatives. We used our uh, family investment banker, Goldman Sachs, and we had what we call a liquidity event. Um, that and took 10 my, years, though, before when you first mentioned it. From the time I brought it up from my original memo mm -hmm. to the time we had the event. Yeah. yeah. And um, but by the time we did it, um, everybody was on board. And so it, it turned out to be the right thing to do and a good thing to do. What turned them around you know, over the 10 years to f think you're the Antichrist to actually agreeing with you and wanting to do it? You know, I think in most situations in life, time's a great healer. Um, and time's also gives people an opportunity to better evaluate it and see some of the perils of, of a business, some of the pluses and the minuses of different kinds of um, decisions. And I, I just, it, it, we got older and, you know, grandkids and fourth generation and fifth generation started coming around. So people's, you know, look at uh, situations differently. Yeah. And um, so I just, it's it just an evolutionary thing, yeah. uh, not unusual at all. You know, I think over time, there's often a lot of acceptance of things that might be um, unacceptable at the beginning of the idea that become acceptable and the norm. Yeah. And I think we see it in our society today with different things that are becoming just very acceptable. And the younger generation just doesn't think twice about things that would have been very controversial 20 years ago. Right. I so mean, you, I, I don't think, you know, life and business is all that far apart in yeah. human behavior. Yeah. I mean, you cut your teeth in that business. Um, 
what were some of the challenges that you faced in that business that you were now able to handle probably more with ease when you started Nature's Sleep? Well, it's great that we're in a company because we were very well capitalized mm. and we had a huge infrastructure and lots of people and lots of everything. And we were the big brand. Yeah, so we were the big guy um, when then I started Nature's Sleep and I've started a lot of other businesses. So I've had a lot of experience. Yeah, I think I read businesses. you you um, sold a company to Microsoft at some point. I co-founded a software company um, that we sold to Microsoft and that was very exciting. Um, I was the guy that really invented the digital bathroom scale back in really, yeah, in 1981, wow. um, and then I sold that company. Women so, everywhere hate you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, right, um, and that's a great story too. Um, but that was a great learning experience, and that was a great innovation. We went from analog to digital, and I searched around all through the world to find the right technology. And my dad had pointed out to me that you know. In the weighing mechanism, in the old days, a strain gauge was the most accurate type of weighing mechanism, but they were super expensive. But when the microprocessor came to be, mm -hmm. that you were able to then use a strain gauge, and you, he said you could figure out how to use a microprocessor, program it, use a strain gauge, which measures electrical impulse on a very hard piece of steel, and see the flex when someone gets onto a, a scale or a, a substrate, and, and measure the, the differential and now have an electronic, uh, a true electronic, you know, weighing mechanism. And so why a digital bathroom scale? Because well, I was, um, I started uh, at college, I worked for uh, Coopers and Libran, um, and which was great on every level for experience and stuff like that. And I got to meet my wife, which was great. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and back in the old days, back which was then, um, it was kind of a taboo to be dating someone in the office, so someone had to go. So I was the guy that went because one of the clients I worked at thought I was a good guy and said, I want to make you my CFO. Hmm. I'm like, great, I'm 23 years old. I'll be happy to be your CFO. <laughs> and um, I became a CFO, and I got very involved with this bathroom company, bathroom scale company, and I could see we need to make the change from analog to digital. Hmm. So I kind of took that on because I'm the inventor kind of guy. Right. And, and I ended up becoming the CEO of that company within a few years. And we really hmm. hit stardom there. And I said to the family member, I think we should sell the business um, because for various reasons, I don't need to go into, but um, I ended up selling that business for him uh, to Dart and Craft, which hmm. basically was Dart became Premark um, and uh, I think Tupperware was was the company from the Dart side and Kraft was Kraft Foods. Hmm. So at the time in 1985, that was a combined entity, which was a Chicago based company. And then I stayed on to run the scale company for a while um, under the Dart and Kraft umbrella. And then from there, I left and, and went to the, uh, the latter business, to the family hmm. business. Mark, this is fascinating. Uh, <laughs> so, there's so, so many I, rabbit holes we can go down. Um, there's, so there's when did the holes and, and I'm a talker, so I'll try not to. No, this is good. The audience here. I no, I love this. Um, at what point then does the software company come up? So um, during my tenure at Warner, we had a, a very large business and we owned a lot of businesses and we invested into a lot of businesses. Yeah. And I was one of the strategic guys that was looking at all kinds of opportunities all the time. And, you know, I stumbled across this software company and invested into it. And so I was, I, I wouldn't say I was the original founder. I would say I was a co-founder yeah. and I helped provide the strategic guidance and the business commercial right. sense. And I could see where we we're going uh, with this business. And it was a, it was a new kind of software rendering um, called design intelligence. Mm -hmm. So basically you could go from uh, a word. What doc year are we talking about? This is like pretty cutting edge. This is like 19. It was like pre-internet. Oh yeah. It was pre-internet. Wow. Yeah. Just on the early, early, it was AOL dial up. It was yeah. early nineties. Wow. And you know, so we wanted to be able, it was a publishing software. So Microsoft used to have a publishing uh, software. Mm -hmm. uh, now it's I think obsolete. So we were kind of competing and taking that to the next generation. And yeah. one of the co-founders of the tech guys, the, the two tech guys were like the third and eighth employee for Microsoft. One of them was friends with uh, wow. Bill Gates growing up from kindergarten on. Jeez. So they were just, when I talk to these guys, smoke comes out of their ears. They, They're just so right. smart. They know exactly what's going They're on. So, they're so smart. It's, it's scary. I, I never really understood what they were saying other than I understood they were super smart and I knew exactly <laughs> what the hell they were doing. 
And one guy kind of wrote like HTML, like the original code, and one guy wrote C++ at Microsoft or something. I mean, right. just really bright guys and, and fun to be around. They're very. Uh, How did you even find this company? I mean, you're in the, the ladder I'm, business at the time. They're in, and by the way, they're in Seattle. Uh, I'm in Greenville, Pennsylvania. I'm right. in Ohio. I'm, Ohio. I'm a way apart. Just someone that a mutual person just connected me with them. Okay. And I went up to meet them, and um, I was just enamored with the science of it, and I saw the potential. Um, but as time went on, I could see also the competition. Right. So I just felt like, you know, we, we're selling the software as part of the engine to HP, so it would render their printer to work more effectively and to computer associates and other people. But all of a sudden, it was kind of being in the enterprise software business or the consumer software business, um, two distinct businesses. And I just didn't think we had the we had the the right play for that. So I thought the better thing was if we could just sell the whole business to oh. someone like a Microsoft. Um, that was the better play. So yeah. we were between selling it to either Computer Associates, HP, or Microsoft. Right. Any one of those guys was a win to me. Um, and I was kind of hopeful that all the employees could stay on because it was a pretty group good group of people. And I think we had over a hundred people at the time in wow. Seattle. And so we did a great deal with Microsoft. They baked it into Office. Uh, first, they had the Microsoft Reader or something like that, but then they really took the core technology baked into Office. This is a long time ago, so I don't know, you know, where it is today because right. things have so many. It times. gets morphed, yeah. Right. I can't speak to today. I can just speak to back then. Um, and everybody was happy and came out very well, and it was a, a very good yeah. experience. It's interesting, Mark. You know, because. You don't necessarily, the way it seems like it works is it's not, you don't think yourself as a business owner, but a lot of it is investor. And um, what's the criteria you have for investing? Because it sounds like you, as you started to grow and the Werner company grew, you were making a lot of different investments in companies too. That was just, when you are in a company like Werner, that's a very large top of your game kind of um, industrial leader. Right. Um, you're looking how to redeploy your capital, right? You're looking, you know, what other things can you put it into? Cause you know, you're a big player in the ladder and market, but the, the market itself is only so big. Right. So if you're 85% of the market, you know, you've only got another 15% to grow plus just, you know, organic growth, which is limited. Right. So you're, you're looking for other opportunities yeah. to deploy your capital in, you know, hardware items or other technologies and stuff like that. So we were always looking for different things to do that would make sense. Right. Um, so we had different criteria. I have different criteria. Um, what, when we sold the Werner company, the thing that I missed the most was being part of my family business. Right. Um, you know, the, the money was nice, but I, I'm a working guy. I don't like retirement. I retired for 10 seconds. I couldn't stand. Um, I like to work and I like my kids to see their dad working. Um, cause I think, you know, to the extent you can, I think everyone should get up in the morning and try to work if it's volunteer work, if it's for pay work. Um, but you know, if you can do it, you should do it. Don't be lazy. Right. Um, I preach that all the time. Um, you know, I don't give good marks for laziness. I give good marks for effort and right. trying. And, um, so I was really wanted my own family business from my family unit. I've had this neck and back problem forever from, uh, running and playing golf and, you yeah. know, just my DNA and mother nature, etc. And I could never find the right mattress and pillow. And yeah, it sounds like you had three neck surgeries. I have three neck surgeries, so, right? I mean, the guy that competes with that is, you know, that I know of is Peyton Manning. Right. And, uh, and I, <laughs> I've never met him, but I would, I would love to, you know, share our stories. But, yeah, that's been a really tough thing. And, you know, it's had a great impact on my life as far as what I can do and can't do and how I, you know, function and stuff like yeah. that. What and was the so, first, second and third? Talk a little bit about that because that, that sounds pretty severe. So in um, in 95, um, actually, in, um, ni in July 4th of 93, I woke up um, living at, in Youngstown, Ohio at the time. And I woke up, I couldn't move. Mm. And I had that neck, stiff neck thing. And I was just, could only look straight with my eyes. It was hideous. And obviously I had a ruptured disc and that had gone into the nerve and it was just inflamed. Mm. And you were a, a doctor of chiropractic. Right. Appreciate. Horrible, yeah. 
I, I just, I, there was nothing I could do. And so I was so afraid of having surgery, the thought of someone cutting into your neck at the time, and there was really no internet to go research this stuff. I mean, you go to the library and look at some books, but anything you looked at was pretty scary. I yeah. talked to doctors and everything I heard was scary. I, just the thought of a neck surgery or a back surgery was so freakish. I just avoided it. And I'm a guy who doesn't even like to get a shot, you know, at the doctor's office. So surgery is not exactly something that I'm going to be comfortable with. So from July of 93 until December of 95, I tried every trick, chiropractors, physical therapy, vitamins, organic foods, yeah. all the tricks. Nothing worked. Yeah, when you had a really ruptured broken, disc. It's, when it's yeah. broken, it's broken. Right. I just couldn't take it. I couldn't sleep. I was just literally in tears. And, you know, a couple nights of not sleeping, you're just a miserable person. Yeah. And so, just a miserable person. So I had the first surgery in 95 December. It was a single discotomy, which I thought was a big deal. And then so it's a little bit better. And then a few months later, it's really not better. And I go to a, a much better doctor. Um, I went to a small hospital, small doctor where I was living, which probably wasn't the smartest idea. Um, and then I went to a major institution in Pittsburgh, um, hour and change from my house. And I worked with, fortunately, Dr. James Kang, which is a very well-known uh, neck surgery. I think he just retired, as a matter of fact. He had practice under a very famous guy at Cleveland Clinic. And so I felt, you know, in good hands with him. And he said, yeah, we can do a double dysotomy. And I'm like, a double? I'd never heard of that. He goes, yeah, it's a new thing now. People are doing doubles. No problem. And yeah. so I two things I board. don't want to hear in the same sentence, a new thing and neck surgery. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> right. And he was just, he was great bedside manner. And I'm like sitting there freaking out like, Oh my God, a double dysotomy. Yeah. I just had this last one. I had to wear this neck brace for three months. This yeah. is not good. And he said, you have no choice. Um, I'm like, okay. So it's just more disruption to the life. And so then I have a double dysotomy. So now I've got all these rods and this, metal titanium cage and all these titanium Jeez. screws in my neck and life changed. You know, I could never run again. Mm. I mean, I used to run 10 miles a day. I couldn't run again. Jeez. I couldn't run. Um, I played a little bit of golf. I went from being a plus two handicap, um, crazy golfer to pretty much limited to no golf. Mm. And, and then the years went on. And then, so then that was 96. And then in 2000, 2001, I'm looking at mattresses and pillows. I can't find anything, wasting money and time. And then decided, because I had such a strong polymer background, because my dad had invented the fiberglass right. fiberglass ladder, I was kind of the lab rat. And all my science fair projects was, was always to do with fiberglass and polymers. And when I was at Werner, when I actually started at the Werner company, I ran the fiberglass business unit. So I was very engaged with everything polymer and i loved it i just loved it and i got i was in the trade groups and with all the vendors and I, I worked in the factory so i was very exposed to it i mean up to my years with you know schmutz and stuff yeah and, you grew up with um, it i grew up with it yeah no i just loved it so i was very familiar with that so to me going into the mattress business was no different than the ladder business because in the ladder business if you look at the materials we went from a wood ladder to an aluminum ladder to a fiberglass ladder each technology got better than the prior, but you still step, you know, got up to the higher shelf, right? You still had the same right. no utility. With the mattresses, we went from in the 1800s from horsehair and cotton stuffed, you know, type mattress to then an inner spring mattress that was developed with springs, and then to the memory foam. And so it's kind of the same type of evolution, same functional thing. You're still sleeping on the mattress, still stepping up on the ladder. So I understood that, uh, the material conversion, and I also understood well shipping big bulky products because they both are big bulky products. A ladder is shipping air on a truck and getting it home in your car is a pain in the ass. And the same thing with a uh, mattress. Right, the logistics, right. So I was able to do some things different with um, Nature Sleep and Ghost Bed. With Nature Sleep, I said, let's do things unlike, let's learn from the Warner Company experience, but take it to the next level. Right. So what I was trying to do was build a business plan and model for what I call the 21st century. Yeah. I didn't want to have all the unions. I didn't want to have all the factories. I wanted to be able to take advantage of all the excess capacity throughout the world. So I, want, I went right to FedEx and said, let's be partners. 
why do I need to reinvent the wheel for logistics when you've got a FedEx? Right. Got the credibility of working with FedEx. So I partnered with them, and then I found contract manufacturing facilities around the globe that I could, you know, use my formulations and stuff to make the products that we designed in those factories. So I was kind of asset light uh, as opposed to being very fixed cost intense. Mm, mm. And that turned out to be the right play. And we also perceived the internet as being the big play, even back in the early 2000s, right. that people would ultimately buy mattresses, pillows, and toppers online. Yeah. It was Which also now sounds sort of normal, but, but then it, it not at all. But normal. Back People weren't even didn't have websites. <laughs> had you know? no websites. They thought I was out of my mind. And then what I did was I put the mattress. I compressed it in the box right out of the box. Yeah. If you look but at I, yeah, I, if anyone goes to ghostbed.com, it shows exactly right. That's what you're talking right. about. Well, well, now it's common, you know, to have the mattress in the box. And now I didn't realize it was even that common. Yeah. Now there's a hundred plus guys doing it, and everyone's taking credit for it in the last couple of years. I started it. 15 years ago because I was trying to handle the logistics for shipping it to customers, for warehousing it, all the economics. I was trying to avoid the latter experience and try to pack it into this box. And it worked great. In fact, at the beginning, when I put a mattress in a box and I showed it to regular brick and mortar retailers, um, the sleepies and mattress firms and those kinds of people, they laughed at us. I thought it was crazy. They said, you're devaluing the product. Get it out of there. You know, you're devaluing it. You're going to make people think it's this piece of crap product. I'm like, no, 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 you're wrong. And they're like, you know, you're wrong. I said, okay, <laughs> we're both wrong. But at some point in the future, I think you'll realize that I'm less wrong. <laughs> and, um, and eventually, yeah, I mean, now it's an accepted thing for the people that know about it. It's very efficient. And, you know, it really changed the dynamics so, you know, that's kind of how I got started. So the nature sleep business started because of my a personal situation and a lot mm -hmm. of prior life experiences and commercial experiences. How long does and it take I, you to formulate, like you said, because you wanted to, you're a very big product inventor person to get very. the formulation you wanted? You know, I'd like to say I read some stories from some of my competitors. And I listen to these long stories and how many people sometimes they have and how long it takes and. I just I don't get it because kind of when you know when you have the experience and you know what you're doing, it doesn't take that long. Mm -hmm. OK, now, I if you ask me how to do brain surgery, I couldn't even start. Okay? I'm just saying, yeah, but it's but like where do you even start do stuff in my my playground? I right. absolutely can, can crank on it. I developed the ghost pillow, which is a patent pending pillow with this cool technology with phase change stuff. And I've made a lot of pillows. And I wanted to make a really, really great pillow for ghost bed on the ghost bed side. Right. And it took me a couple days. The whole thing. What do you do? What's your process? Do you like cut open <laughs> like a hundred pillows and like? No. What no, do you I do? I mean, I look at all kinds of stuff, but yeah. I just know what I need it to feel like. So I know, like for this gel memory foam, I know in order to get that feel, what the formulation needs to be, and I know it needs to be cool because people like cool pillows. So I helped develop this phase change, this new technology, and I knew that what kinds of fabrics are required to to use that you'll get the the smooth feel and the coolness and the durability. And then on the packaging side, I know you know I'm a big believer. I always say this. Anyone who knows me hears me say this all the time. Americans eat with their eyes. Right. And so if you make it appealing, you're ready one half the battle. Right. So when I package things or anything I do, I like it to be very attractive. Like in Nature Sleep or Ghost Bed, I always have our brand on every one of my products. Yeah. Just like every Werner ladder has the blue oval Werner everywhere on the ladder. Right. It's branding, it's brand awareness, and all that kind of stuff. It's very, very important. I mean, you just buy a bunch of different materials and kind of lay out. I mean, I'm just trying to no, picture. That's no, probably no. why we don't have video because you have these innovative cooling <laughs> technologies behind you that I you can't share with the public. Right, exactly. Um, that plus, you know, I got a, a lot of stuff just over the years. I'm 60 years old, so I got a lot of stuff between the years just from trial and error. You know, I've been a mad scientist for a long time. How do you start selling that? So, like, you have the infrastructure, you were able to solve the infrastructure based off of your expertise and kind of partnering with different companies, but you still have to sell the product. So, so then you, what do you do? I, I always believe, you know, you, you have to have a great product yeah. and, and you, 
have to be high quality, low cost. And um, you can, you know, I can get doors open because I've got history with different national accounts or small accounts, et cetera. But it has to be a good product and it has to last because mm-hmm. ultimately the consumer is the judge. And uh, especially in the world we live in today, it's so real time. It's so transparent. Um, the reviews are out there all the time. You live and die by what you're doing. So I've always erred on making a better product. And because it's really for most companies, it's just not that much more expensive to do it right. I don't understand why other companies don't just invest more money in it so they make less money. Big deal. Make a great product that you can be proud of. You know, like I I give this example all the time. I've been wearing Brooks Brothers shirts since I'm a little kid. Mm -hmm. I mean, the same kind of shirts, okay? In fact, you know the store over at Northbrook Court? That's the one I used to go to. Yeah. Right right there, okay? Um, And all they've done for the past 40 years is make the damn shirt cheaper and cheaper quality-wise and more expensive price-wise. Okay, I want the shirt they used to make 30 years ago. Okay, just bring me back that shirt. Okay, I'll pay whatever you you want to get for it now to make your margin. I'm good with that. Just bring back that shirt. I keep hunting for that shirt and I can't find it. And you, they keep changing it and changing it. And that's the way it is with so many products. They just keep taking cost out, taking cost out because they're trying to make margin all the time. So much pressure to make the margins and make the numbers. I said, I can control my own destiny. This is my company, Nature Sleep Ghost Bed. I'm putting the quality in. And the response has been phenomenal. People understand quality. They respect product at quality. They appreciate it. And they expect and they respect good value. And, you know, the beauty of controlling your own destiny and not being a public company and not being so accountable to other people is that you can do that. And it wins. Quality always wins. It always wins. Sure, you could probably make more money if you cut corners in the short term and do things like that. I don't want to do that. I'm about quality. And just like my Werner name is on endless amounts of products around the globe, I am not harming my name, my family name. I've got my kids that work here, my grandson. I've got a grandson now. Congratulations. Yeah, I look, thank you. I, I look forward to my kids and and my other coworkers and their kids or whatever um, being part of this and being proud of it. Yeah. I mean, quality is huge um, to spread the word. How did you initially get in front of people? What were some of the, the methods you did to, you know, get that initial buzz and so people started spreading it? A lot of, a lot of missionary work, you know, just yeah. knocking out a lot of doors and calling a lot of people and getting the door slammed and being the new guy. And, you know, yeah. it just doesn't happen overnight. Yeah, no, hundred um, percent. It doesn't happen overnight. So, you know, I started the nature sleep thing 15 plus years ago and knocked on a lot of doors, got, you know, disappointed many times, but you just can't give up. You just have to keep doing it and doing it and putting up with the crap and just keep doing it. <laughs> That's all you can do. Okay. And just keep the hard work and you just, you, you can't um, you can't get too disenfranchised. You have to keep yeah. go- going and going. And on the ghost bed side, which is our direct to consumer side, yeah, so that other of, side, the nature sleep, is more you go wholesome. from the go to the different mattress stores or companies or uh, sorry the, right. the stores. That's, that's either a dot com, you know, um, an Amazon dot com or Costco dot com or you know Costco retail, you know, or a retail store where it's a brick and mortar. That's what Nature Sleep does. Mattresses, right. pillows, toppers, dog beds, memory foam slippers, et cetera, yeah. all kinds of different variations, et cetera, that you could buy physical brick and mortar or on their respective online um, stores. Right. Um, Ghostbed is my you know, sister company where that's my what's called direct-to-consumer, the new right. direct-to-consumer space. And that's different because now I can directly interact with the customer. I can advertise and I can engage with the end customer and have a one-on-one relationship that I've never had that before because I've always gone through wholesale distribution. Right. You know, in the ladders, we sold Home Depot. They sold the customer. I didn't know the customer. Mm. You know, I, I see people that have my product, but I didn't interact with them. Now I get to interact with them. It's awesome, you know, because I get the feedback, right. what they like, what they don't like, um, et cetera, et cetera. And we have a whole customer support team that's interacting with them, either telephonically, web chats, or um, social media. I mean, the, the amount of questions that come into the social media is nonstop. Yeah. 
most of them are very nice. Some people, you know, not all people are very nice. <laughs> so they can be a little aggressive. You know, maybe they're a little bit uh, inebriated. Maybe they're just had a bad day. Maybe they just feel like dumping on someone. But, you know, they can light it up a little bit. But our game plan is always be nice. Always be nice. So, Mark, I mean, you are super busy, busy enough. What made you decide to torture yourself and create Ghostbed? Um, my ghost bed plan was laid out years ago. Was it? Okay. Years ago. Um, you know, the original mattress I designed for ghost bed was in 07. Um, the only change I made to the, my original design was I substituted the memory foam for the newer technology today, which is Joe memory foam. Hmm. Um, obviously some new fabric technologies, yeah. but the original design, cause I knew it was a great design that I was, uh, made for s some other retailers in 07, um, was just a great design. Um, but I knew you had to go direct because you did, okay. Because you could have just as easily brought that to your, you know, Nature Sleep and have another product line, you know. Oh, I, I could have, and I have, and I sold a similar bed, um, pretty much through the, the Nature Sleep. But um, the the market is changing, so you've got a consolidation um, in the brick and mortar space, massive consolidation. So there's fewer customers, just like in every industry. There's only it's an oligopoly. There's only a handful of people. Yeah. So the smaller guys are weaker, and they are uh, higher credit risk, low, all kinds of other challenges, uh, unfortunately. And the bigger guys have gotten much more, much bigger and, and more powerful and more demanding. I mean, just in our industry recently, you had Mattress Firm, the biggest retailer out there, get divorced with their biggest supplier, Tempur-Pedic Sealy. Mm -hmm. So here's, here's a thing where Tempur-Pedic is probably doing... Seven hundred million dollars worth of their three billion in sales with one customer, Jeez. and that that's at wholesale. So on retail, that's probably a billion and a half dollars worth of retail sales for a mattress firm. Right. And the two firms had enough disagreement about whatever the issues are, and let's leave those to them. Um, yeah. That got divorced, and it was a very public divorce, and it's very painful. They're just going through the, the first couple months of it, and I'm sure it will be you know a pretty big game changer in our space. How does that affect you? Um, it probably, if, probably in a couple of ways, um, both of which I would say would be in a positive way, mm -hmm. um, in terms of an opportunist way. Um, but I wouldn't want to say too much more. Um, Mattress Firm is a great company and we, we, we are fortunate enough to supply them. Yeah. Uh, and, um, Tempur-Pedic, just a competitor, Temper and Sealy is a competitor, but you know, really good, smart people and make good products and been a real pioneer in the industry for a very long time. So these things happen, um, but it's a, it's a really the result, I think, of the concentration of power. And when you know, f when there's fewer players, they just both have a lot of power. Right. Uh, and so, you know, you, you it's more difficult in the business world to, to deal in those situations. You know, rather than having a you know a thousand customers, you've got you know ten customers doing the same business of a, as a thousand. It changes the dynamics quite yeah. a bit on both sides. Um, and that's the beauty and kind of the evolution of the direct to consumer business. Yeah. Because now I can, you know, deal direct with the end consumer, give a much better um, deal to the end consumer because you're you are eliminating some layers of distribution costs, um, and um, the consumer wins. Consumer always wins. When the consumer wins, everyone mm -hmm. wins because that's what really matters. Mm -hmm. and, and the consumer savvy, and you know, they're always going to find the, the most efficient thing. And if you look at most retailing venues today they're an outcry of some next generation from prior things you know the home depot got successful because all these other distributors the roofing distributor and the plumbing distributor and electrical distributors were all little kind of um, industries of distribution networks that were multiple step distributions like who needed to hand off a pipe three times before the plumber got it if the plumber went basically right to the guy who made the pipe right. it would be cheapest for everybody right yeah so now he can uh, uh, cost effectively go to a Home yeah. Depot who can afford to buy in mass volume, right. big bulky things, and let the plumber buy it at a cost effective rate. Yeah. But he, as Home Depot became successful, it's because all these other kind of dis cottage industry distributors went out of business. Uh, no different than what Amazon's doing to all of retail today. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, from Macy's to Kohl's to Nordstrom's, Bed Bath, you name it, everyone's continues to restructure and reorganize and try to get the omni-channel thing right right it's it's gonna be a hell of a challenge 
And as soon as they're, you know, they're done with this restructuring a year from now, they'll have the next restructuring. It'll be more stores and more people laid off because the Amazon effect is monstrous. I mean, people need to understand, embrace Amazon. They're a phenomenal company and it's just an easy shopping experience. They made it really easy yeah. and they spent a long time building out, building out incredible, you know, network on all fronts. It's a very the most powerful you know startup of all times and um but it's a real threat to m majority of uh, of retailers like brick and mortar yeah yeah it's a real threat where can people buy ghostbed obviously they can go to ghostbed.com where else can they purchase it so you can go to ghostbed.com or amazon mm -hmm. and we've kept the distribution very very limited to that mm -hmm. and what I see, Mark, you do really well is you surround yourself by a good team. Um, could you talk about how you bring on a team for Nature Sleep and Ghost Bed? Because I also saw, I think there was a high level person in Tempur-Pedic and you probably have like a, a number of people who have uh, come together and helped you know, build the company. We have hired people slowly. Um, and we've tried to find people that kind of share our kind of work ethic and core values. Um, I like a safe environment. I like people to be treated well. I don't like a pressure cooker. I'm a workaholic. I don't expect people to do what I do. You know, I'm 60 years old. I get home at 10 o'clock at night. I, maybe <laughs> I, I mean, it's kind of crazy. Right. I like it. I don't, I don't mind it. My wife accepts it. Um, and you know, we're just in a crazy growth mode the last couple of years, especially so it's even more taxing, but you know, we, we've tried to hire the kind of right people and our team is long-term. Uh, I don't have much turnover. Right. Um, we try to pay people well, we treat people well, we give good benefits. We try to make it a solid environment. What do you hire for first when you're initially hiring? Cause like you said, you're hiring slow. Who do you hire well, first? You know, at the very beginning, I, you know, I, I think you, like in my situation, I'm able to do a number of things. I can develop products. I understand economics. Um, I can I understand logistics. Uh, I understand sales, and I can sell. So I, I can wear a lot of hats. Right. I'm used to that. So um, it depends, you know, for different startup entrepreneurs what their skill sets are. If they're pretty young and they don't have much experience, um, they might only have one core strength. You know, maybe he's a programmer or something. Right. Uh, he is a programmer and needs to find the resources elsewhere. But you you got to have sales. You know, I, I always say you can have a great product, but if you don't have sales, it doesn't make a damn bit of difference. Right. Thing starts with the top line. You got to have sales, a and then you got to have some kind of finance accounting function. So you got to have capital. You got to be able to account for everything. Got to know what things cost. You can't fake yourself. You got to know what things cost, and you, you and you can't bullshit yourself whatsoever. And so you, you need someone that can help you and, and be very honest in that um, role. And um, then, you know, especially on the digital side, this is a marketing game. You've got to have the digital marketing strength. You've got to have the marketing strength. Mm -hmm. You've got to have an operations person that really understands the, the, the core issues, the product, the, the purchasing of the product, the contracting the product, the, the quality of the product, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, you bring that together and then the customer experience people and that team and processing of orders. Um, you know, I always say here, we're kind of a transaction factory. In the old days, we used to get orders from big accounts and you'd ship truckloads, you know, 10 truckloads of ladders for this guy. Um, one order, 10 truckloads. Now, <laughs> each truckloads, you know, 400 orders. So now you get 4,000 orders instead of one order. So now you got to process 4,000 orders. Yeah. Uh, and, Logistics, you know, make sure you, yeah. Make sure everything's entered properly and the right item gets shipped to the right person at the right time and the tracking number gets to everybody. So it's a different kind of uh, game today. Yeah. And you have, have the systems that set that up. You need the, you know, the IT people. Um, and then you need to kind of take advantage of these great software systems and cloud based systems and the evolution of it because it's really changed um over the years and i have watched the change from traditional accounting to the type of way we do accounting today i mean debits and credits haven't changed but just the efficiency of the software to handle this kind of stuff mm -hmm. so when information comes in you want to capture it once and explode it through your system yeah. so you keep touching it and re-entering it what kind of software do you use to run uh, the e-commerce side of things so at the ghost web we use um wordpress as the the software, which is very popular, and then we use WooCommerce, mm -hmm. uh, the shopping engine. 
for um, running our business, we're actually just transitioning to a, an upgraded system on April 1st, um, after a year of hard you know, conversion and training and research, to NetSuite, which is now part of Oracle. Hmm. So we're going to a complete cloud-based, cutting-edge system with NetSuites, and mm-hmm. we're very excited about that. Nice. And, and that will encompass the, it's what I call ERP. It will be the, like inventory management type of stuff too? Or? Everything. Yeah. Order entry, inventory, financials, you know, marketing. It's it's the the, the everything system. Mm-hmm. And um, we did a lot of evaluations and we decided that made the most sense for our, our uh, circumstances. So we go live with that. Nice. And, um, and then everything's, you know, tied back to your mobile phone. So you have... Uh, complete visibility of whatever you need and it's great and it's also um it's a complete cloud system so we're headquartered in south florida so we do occasionally get the hurricanes and lose power for a week or so um so that's a it's it's a smart backup yeah mark thank you so much for your time um this has been hugely valuable i have one or two last questions for you Every should, you know, everyone should check out naturessleep.com. I guess for this purpose, people should go more towards ghostbed.com, ghostbed. right? Yeah. So they ghostbed. should ghostbed.com and check out, you know, you have a bunch of different products, pillows, beds, um, anywhere else we should point people towards as far as the ghost bed side. I think that would be good. You know, obviously our Facebook page has a lot of traffic, a lot of fun stuff. Um, but the website is, is very informative. Yeah. And- has a lot of information. Yeah, sure. and you know, part of our value proposition is basically the ghost bed is for a, under eight hundred dollars, you get a queen mattress delivered, and we ship in twenty four hours, mm. and you have a hundred one night sleep trial. So if you don't like it, we pick it up and we donate it to a charity, so you don't have to worry about that. And um, it's the same basic mattress I sell, brick and mortar people. I won't mention their names, but major names that they would be selling for three thousand dollars. Yeah, that's amazing. So, Kind of shows you the value proposition for sure, and we we back it with twenty years worth of warranty. Quality, yeah. So, um, so last question, Mark, is one I always ask since it's in Inspired Insider. What's been the lowest business moment, and on the flip side, what's been one of the proudest moments in business for you? Well, um, I think one of the lowest would be a pretty sad story where one of our female employees um, who's in the computer programming area um, was coming to work last year um, at 7.30, coming into just going to get out of her car in the parking lot, and her crazy estranged husband assaulted her and then Mm. doused her with gasoline and lit her on fire. Holy cow. And it was all caught on, like, uh, office cameras um and um that was a pretty horrifying thing that um i would even know of that yet alone someone that we you know works for us that we really care about that was really hurt in a very horrible way wow. and that was just a very very low moment um and she probably would have died but we were able to get her to the um jackson burn center and she was in a coma for a few months and she's recovering it's really horrible mm, she survived wow she survived, and we've kept her job open for her. So, um, and we kept taking care of her, and um, so we look forward for her actually coming back here hmm. uh, in the next three. Sorry or four to months. hear that. Jeez. So that was a very, very sad moment for all of us. And um, as far as um, a high moment, you know, I think a high moment for me because I'm really into the um, the family business stuff. So I'm really happy that my daughter, who's really important. Um, and my wife works with us full time nice. works here. And, you know, in the future, I look forward to my sons working here and then my, uh, grandkids. So that's kind of a high moment. And we get a lot of reviews on the ghost bed and they just flow in constantly all day long. And they're just, they're just great. And it's just, it's a real buzz for me personally when I see that I had back pain and I slept on this and it's gone. I'm pregnant and I had a, couldn't sleep and it's gone. I had insomnia. It's gone. You know, all these things that and the success no stories. Idea. Yeah. How positive it had a, an effect on people's lives because sleep I know is so important. And when I you just keep seeing these stories every day, come in and come in, it's, that's a high point. That to me is a big win. Yeah. Mark, I want to be the first one to thank you. Hopefully when you come through Chicago, we'll get to meet in person. Everyone should check out 
ghostbed.com. And uh, it's been fantastic. Thank you so much. Yeah. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. 